Yes. All right. So after doing all the limit work for the first function, you ended up with an f prime of x of what? Negative 1 over x squared. All right, so again, you're doing it by the limit definition. Right now, we're just concerned with the answer. All right. So then we look at the other one, 1 over x minus 1, and we find that derivative, which ended up being what? Positive 1 over x minus 1? Negative 1 over x minus 1 squared. All right. So we have our two derivatives. Uh, in, in terms of structure, they look very similar to one another. And that's because g of x is really a composite function. All right. And that's, you know, that whole parent function thing from Algebra 2. When, when you learned about it, you're like, OK, uh, parent functions. Why do we need to learn about these parent functions? How on earth could they even be remotely useful? If you know what the general structure is of a function, then any variation on that would still follow similar properties. Right? So if I'm looking at f of x equals 1 over x, and then I have some other function, h of x, for example, that's equal to x minus 1, then f following g of x would be 1 over x minus 1. So this is the composition of two functions, all right? So, but it, just looking at the structure of it, in terms of the derivative, they also seem to be following the same idea. Different parent function, but the result is still the same, all right? So if we're looking at this as the kind of situation where we want to plug one function into another, then maybe that's the kind of thing that could hold true for the derivatives also, all right? So that's the suspicion at this point, all right? But in terms of transformations, if you were to compare, you could do this on your calculator if it's not something that you can see in your mind. Batteries are low. function, transformed function, right? It looks like it shifted one unit to the right, okay? So the impact of that, if this were an Algebra 2 class, I w obviously wouldn't be talking about derivatives. We would just be looking at the functions and saying, what, what's happening to 1 over x in order to get you 1 over x minus 1, all right? So this is a function that is translated right one unit. All right, so one over x minus two would be translated right two units, one over x plus pi would be translated left pi units. All right, so a bunch of different possibilities, but basically we're getting at the idea of a translation. All right, now in terms of the slope, because, again, that's what a derivative is addressing. Um, I'm really looking at the same graph, just shifted right one unit. So the slopes would be the same at corresponding points on either graph. All right? So if I'm looking at, and I'll just do, just so it's on the recording, I'll do the roughest of sketches. something like this and these are supposed to be the same graph just one is a shifted version of the other so if I'm looking at the slope for example at this location I don't know what that value is I'll call it I'll call it C 
That would correspond to the slope at this location, which would be C plus one, right? Because it's one unit to the right, right? So if you kind of bear this out mathematically, so numerically, let's say you were to plug in a, a two for X here. In order to get the same result, they'd have to plug in a three, right? Plug in a two for X, they get one half. Plug in a three for X, they get one half, right? So that's really illustrating the, the translation. So what we want to do is determine if that's going to hold up for the derivatives also, right? So let's say I plug in a, a one here, I get negative one over one. But if I plug a one in here, I would not get that. But that makes sense because it's a shifted version of it. So when I plug in a one here, I want to plug in a two there. If I plug in a one here, I get negative one. Plug in a two here, I get negative one also. So it's a shifted version of the derivative, which means all the properties of the slopes are the same, just for different x values, specifically one larger. All right. So that's kind of a nice realization, because it tells us that if we're just looking strictly at a translation, if I know what the derivative of the parent function is, then I can infer what the derivative of our translated function would be. All right. So the relationship, so I answered all those questions. Translation. I'm going to write left and right, left or right, just to keep it kind of general. But in this case, obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a translation to the right. But this idea would hold up whether you shifted left or right, so I wanted to relationship between the derivatives also translated my nib is falling off so when you found the derivative of this again using the limit definition you got what All right, and so instead of actually finding it with the limit definition, now that you've had the explanation, the, the second part, if you're relying on what we learned on the previous page, we would be saying g prime of x would be equal to one over two times the square root of x plus two. All right, and again, that's because we're looking at one graph, f of x, and it's translation this time two units to the left. All right, again, these are supposed to be identical graphs, but you know, you know about my, uh, my drawing ability by now. So maybe we check it. So I suspect that the derivative of the square root of x plus two is equal to one over two times the square root of x plus two. I don't need to see the original graph, I know what that looks like right now. In y4, math eight, x, I'm gonna point it to y1, x, so that I'm looking at the derivative, what the calculator thinks the derivative of that original function is, compared to what I think the derivative of that original function. I'm gonna make it bold. Zoom six. That's what I think. That's what the calculator thinks. They seem to be tracing to the same graph. All right, so pretty solid way of verifying your answer. And again, you will on the AP, on tests, have situations where you must use the calculator, situations where you must do it by hand, and then you have that gray area where it's maybe a kind of question on the calculator part that you could technically do by hand, but expediency tells you, oh, well, I should probably go to the calculator for this. All right. So in those cases, you want to, that, that's where you can kind of save some time. You want to get to a point where you're so fluent with how things work in the calculator that you see a question and automatically you go to the calculator because you recognize that that's the kind of situation you're in. Yeah. 
What's the relationship between the graphs, the derivatives? Okay, so th this is all asked and answered. All right, so see previous page, I guess. So I'll just put a check through it. Now we're in a different situation because constant multiples affect the size of the graph, uh, specifically the distance from the origin. So when I look at just the graph of y equals x squared, which is very easy to do. Probably the first nonlinear graph you ever learned about. You're looking at something like this. And then in this case, it's something much wider. All right. And that's because each y value is now half the distance <coughs> as what it was for the parent function. All right, so you're not going up as much as you go further and further out for x. All right, so that's the impact that the constant multiple has on the original function. Now the question is, what's the impact that it has on the derivative? So you use the limit definition, and you got what for number 10? 2x. So then, whether you did it with the limit definition or not, it, it should have ended up being pretty straightforward, right? Because a constant multiple can be factored out of a limit. So if I go through the entire process, you know, something like limit as x approaches a f of x, which would be 1 half x squared, minus f of a, 1 half a squared, over x minus a. Because I have a common 1 half, I can just pull that right out of the limit. That's the one mathematical truth you can always rely on. Whether it's limits, derivatives, antiderivatives, summations, Basically, just uh, anything you can think of, any process that you can think of, constant multiples generally can be factored out. All right. So what this ends up being, what I have in black, is the derivative of my function f. So what I get from this is, if I know the derivative of the parent function, all I have to do is multiply it by the constant multiple, and I'll have the derivative of the child function I, I I don't know I think there's like a name the, the rest of the family but I, I'm not ready to go full-blown Ingram on you and start calling you family uh, two actually Yeah, I think uh, not officially allowed to ask that. But it's only like 30 minutes away, so you could probably be back within like an hour and 15 minutes. Now walking the dog would be tougher, obviously, because that's, that's up to the dog. Gas, yeah, all that stuff, all, all the economics of it would have to be factored in. So, yeah, it's a lot of uh, logistics to work out, so I'll get, I'll get working on that. All right, so what would be the relationship between the derivatives of parent functions and the functions that are dilations? Well, we know that, but let's prove it real quick. As, as proofs go, this is actually not as terrible as it, as it could be. So uh, actually, I'll go with f of x just to keep it as simple as I can. So 
So some general function k times, I'll go g of x. All right, so this, this demonstrates a constant multiple. You have one function that is a multiplier of the other. So what I would want to do is find the derivative f prime of x, in which case I would be using the limit definition on this guy. And so I'd have the limit as x approaches a of k times g of x minus k times g of a over x minus a. All right, common k, constant multiple. When we have some unknown constant multiple, we generally go with k. But, and you might think c sounds like a better choice, but we use c for something else later in the course, so, uh, so we'll just use k. So factor it out. g of x minus g of a over x minus a which is g prime of x. And we have that k as a coefficient. And so what we get from this is that f prime of x is equal to k times g prime of x. So that's telling me that if I have a function that involves a constant multiple, all I have to do is take the derivative of the parent and then multiply it by the constant multiple later on. Right? So, now, these kind of proof questions, they seem like extra info that maybe would not necessarily make its way onto a test. Uh, they tend to make their way onto a test. So. so if you haven't been writing it down, I recommend you take a snapshot of it. Um, if you don't want to take a snapshot of it, it'll be up on YouTube later on. You could do that, too. All right. So, but yeah, pretty, uh, pretty important stuff. Yeah, because basically, I'll, I'll just tell you. Uh, and, and you all did, uh, well, most everyone did extremely well in the last test. Um, the, the class average was in the 90s, so, I mean, that's, that's incredibly rare. Um, yeah, yeah, so it, it's just a good class. Yeah, so that's, that's wonderful. Uh, but I will still continue to point out the differences between regular calculus and AP calculus, not with the expectation that you all need to drop, you know, like not that kind of, like that's not my rationale. It's more like just so you get a sense of what is an AP question and what is not. Uh, we wouldn't, I don't want to say obviously, you wouldn't know. We wouldn't do this in a regular calculus course, that's part. We would just talk about what the relationships are and use that information to hopefully help us understand derivative shortcuts. But then when I get to derivative shortcuts, it's like, all right, you didn't understand the theory behind it. Well, that's okay, because we have all these shortcuts. They'll get you the right answer until such time as you do understand the underlying theory. It's the reverse here. It's let's really get a good sense of the underlying theories because we don't know specifically how the college board is gonna phrase a question on the AP and the free response. Even multiple choice can be tricky too, but the free response area, you don't, it, like they'll take an idea and every administration will just ask questions about that idea in a slightly different way. And if you're not prepared for the, the notation, the verbiage, or whatever, then you, you'll, you'll have that moment during the AP where you're staring at a problem. Yeah, I have no freaking clue how to do this one. <clears throat> All right, well, there goes the five, the four. I'll be lucky if I get a three now. And then you come running down to me and I only say this because somebody actually came running down right at the end of the AP to tell me that I didn't teach them something. This is, this is on the exam, you didn't go over this. And I'm like, oh, that? You just do that and that and you're done. Oh, come on, really? And that, that's the reality. I'm like, I, I could have done that. I'm like, well, you should have. So, you know, that, that's, the, that's the whole issue there. You know, so if you're not prepared for the multitude of ways that a question could be phrased, then it's all over. So uh, I'll talk to you about problem sets in a minute, but that's one thing that'll kind of help you get going in the right. All right. All right. Hmm. 
Interesting. Oh, yeah, okay, so I, I was thrown off by my own structure here. All right, so you did it with the limit definition, number 13, and you came up with... Two x to the three halves. All right, so something equivalent to that. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll come back to it in a couple minutes. I want to have the uh, the mind blowing moment here. All right, so now we're taking a look at number fourteen using what we know about the parent function, all right? So first thing I'm gonna do is rewrite it slightly, and slightly at first, and then less uh, obviously second, so two x minus three. All right, so that's my first move. Now, the two x minus three might not seem like a translation, because that two is there. If that two wasn't there, I'd be saying, okay, let's translate to the right three units and be done with it, and I have my answer. Not the case, all right? So we wanna make a subtle adjustment here. And this is, uh, this is for all you people who like math. It's one of those moves where it's like, whoa, I can do that. That's crazy. So let's just take the radical two X minus three off on the side. I'm gonna divide by two, all under the radical. Some operation divide by two, you can't do that. I just change the whole value of the expression. So in order to make it of equivalent value, I'm also gonna multiply by two. All right, so then it becomes x, minus three halves times two, all, all still under the radical. But what I've successfully done is I, I got rid of the coefficient of x, but I still have that two there, so let's make that go away also. I'm gonna rewrite that as root two times the root of x minus three halves. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Because, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what your background is with trig graphs, but at some point you might have been asking yourself, well, in my pre-calc class, I, I use this formula. But in your pre-cal class, you might have used this one. They're equivalent depending on what on earth H and K are. But if you use the same process to come up with an expression here that starts with an X, so basically that dividing and multiplying approach, what you would end up with as the value for h is negative c over b. So that's where that would come from. And so, and actually that's where the formula for phase shifting comes from. So it's the same approach, it's just you may not have ever learned the origin story behind this just because it wasn't relevant. Now it is, all right? So I'm looking at a constant multiplier of two over root two What is two over root two equivalent to? Which is the same as rad two. All right, just for simplicity's sake, not something that's always required, but again, you've seen multiple choice questions. Your answer doesn't always match their answer, but they're equivalent. All right, so all of that was to get g of x in the proper format.
All right, so we have our constant multiplier. Hang on to that. We know our derivative should follow the model of negative one over two x to the three halves. So times negative one over two times this x to the three halves, this quote unquote x, this translated function. And so our derivative here, g prime of x, actually would simplify to negative root 2, 2 times x minus 3 halves to the 3 halves. We're following this model, which I'm going to go over right now. But we're following this derivative, which had an exponent of 3 halves. Yeah, but it's coming from a radical. So isn't that just the power to the 1 half? And why would it be just 3 over 2? Oh, no, it's, this was the original function. This is the function's derivative. So I'm not, I'm not rewriting this to get this step. Oh, I changed okay. the whole function. Okay. Yeah. All right, so back to number 13, we wanted the limit definition approach. Still have time, right? Yeah. Okay. So limit as x approaches a of 1 over root x minus 1 over root a over x minus a. Common denominator. If you get a common denominator, you'll have the limit as x approaches a of root a minus root x over root x a over x minus a. All right, radicals, we talked about these tricks two classes ago, three classes ago, something like that. But when, ra when dealing with radicals, oftentimes a conjugate comes into play. So let me just rewrite it so it's a little cleaner. Then I'm going to factor the bottom. So I have the root a minus root x over root x a. I'm going to factor this x minus a as a difference of two squares. So I'd be looking at root x, root x. And actually, let me shove that over a little bit. Minus root a, root x plus root a. These would cancel. They're exact opposites, so they cancel to a negative 1. So this becomes the limit as x approaches a of negative 1 over the root of x times a times the root of x plus the root of a. Now I can apply the limit, replacing all my a's with x's. So negative 1 over root x times x, which is root x squared, which is just x. And then root x plus root x is 2 root x. So very close to the simplest form of the final answer. If I rewrite this as negative 1 over 2 times x times x to the 1 half, we have an, imply, an implied power of 1 here. Keep the base and add our exponents. And we would be looking at negative 1 over 2x to the 3 halves. And that would be my f prime of x. All right. Before too long, we're going to have to actually just either memorize some derivatives or uh, use some shortcut rules. But the underlying theory is really important because Believe it or not, especially those of you who have some experience with uh, calculus, you know, maybe you were in BC last year, you know about things like product rule, quotient rule, chain rule. This process, this activity, 
is the chain rule. I just haven't done any chain rule. But this is the essence of that chain rule. This is why the chain rule works. All right, so if you can wrap your heads around this activity, it's, I, I don't call something an activity and, and just make it filler work. I, I call it an activity because it's a way for you to d discover the underlying concepts. All right, so just going through it and getting answers. I mean, activities I don't collect, I don't grade them. You know, just putting down the answers doesn't do, a, do anybody a bit of good. Consider why you're doing everything you're doing when you're doing it. That, that leads to the, the understanding that I'm hoping that you'll get. Um, on the second step here, I instead of like factoring the bottom out, like the denominator, I multiply the top and bottom by radical A plus radical A. Conjugate, yep, yeah, yeah so perfectly fine. Yep. Uh, for, for square root radicals, conjugates are a wonderful resource. It's only when you start getting into other types of roots, cube roots, quartic roots, whatever. Um, that's when things get a little out of hand. So, and you probably want to go with a factoring approach. But yeah, conjugates, if you can make them work, that's definitely the way to.